Meet the ocean. You know, my family come from an Italian family. Um, I'm a freelance photographer, and I remember the, I had the cover of a National Geographic kids magazine at the time it was called world and i showed my grandmother and i thought oh this is you know she's going to be all excited and things like that and she said so you got a steady job with these national geographic people and i said no no i'm a freelancer and she said so you still don't got a job <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Meet the Ocean. I'm your host, Paul North, and today we have a very special interview for you with photographer, biologist, and environmentalist, Steve Morella. His work has appeared in a variety of publications, including National Geographic, World Wildlife Fund, and many educational children's magazines like Ranger Rick. As you listen, you will quickly realize that Steve has a magnificent sense of humor, but more so, and more deeply, that he cares about our planet and all of its inhabitants. He holds a position on the board of the Alaska Whale Foundation and owns a vast knowledge of the marine mammals of our oceans. I have personally had the pleasure of traveling with Steve to an assortment of locations, including the polar regions. Enough to learn from him and have the privilege to call him a friend. Meet the Ocean believes in the power of storytelling and recognizes the need for more accessible science communication to benefit the public's understanding internationally. We are a listener-supported podcast and nonprofit. Thus, all contributions are tax deductible. You can find more educational content and ways to donate on our website at meettheocean.org. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast to never miss an episode. And if you can do us the favor of rating and reviewing our podcast wherever you download them from, it will help us to reach a broader audience with our educational outreach. We appreciate you listening. And without further ado, here's our episode, which took place on the National Geographic Explorer on the way south to Antarctica. I'm uh, Stephen Morello, and I'm a freelance photographer, and here on the Explorer, I'm a photo instructor for the guest. Yeah, what does a photo instructor entail? Um, basically, you know, I always think that I have the best job because uh, maybe not as good as the undersea specialist, but, <laughs> but I get to talk to people about photography, which is my passion, and I love to talk shop, you know, when I'm home. I'm home by myself, or if I'm out working on an assignment, I'm by myself. And when you get to interact with people and just talk photography, it's always kind of fun. You learn about uh, new gadgets. Actually, I learn an awful lot from the guests. A lot of them come with equipment that I've never even seen before. So, you know, it's always a learning thing for me, too. So it's always fun to do. So I help people get the images that are going to become the memories when they get home. So for you, where did your kind of exploration of photography begin? Oddly enough, when I was younger, a teenager, and I had some friends and we used to go hiking in the Satchwagunks in the Catskills in New York. And it used to irritate me that my buddies all had cameras because it slowed us down. And I wanted to hike, and they would be stopping and things of that sort. So I actually, I, I kind of think it's really odd that I end up being the photographer. When I finished school, I started researching whales, and I was part of a group that produced environmental education programs for kids. So I was working with photographers, and I also, besides doing things in and around with them, around whales, I would go out to sea on government research vessels, and they couldn't come with me. So they said, you got to get a camera, and you got to make images out there. And one 
photographer in particular. I traded him probably a little more than a summer of coming to where I lived in Provincetown on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and staying with me on weekends in return for him teaching me photography. And then it just was that I was doing it every day. I was photographing whales every day. That was at the time my passion. It was more of a tool. And I kind of was in the right place at the right time. I've been really, really blessed that a lot of other photographers came through Provincetown to see the whales, to photograph whales. It was a long time ago, over 30 years ago, and it was at the beginning of kind of the whale phenomena period where a lot of people got interested. And National Geographic was doing a book about the seashores of America and sent a photographer up to photograph Cape Cod National Seashore. He hired me as his guide because I was a local naturalist. In hanging out with him and everything, he knew that I photographed whales a lot, looked at my images, and he suggested that we send my photos of whales to his editor because then he wouldn't have to go out whale watching. Um, He could spend the time doing other things and It was, you know, that was my break, so to speak. They bought a bunch of my photos, put them in the book, and all of a sudden, I found myself then with a call from the New York Times and then calls from other people and other places looking for photos of whales. And eventually, I had to make a decision whether I wanted to continue down the road of being a biologist or to switch and become a photographer. It's interesting to think of it as as two paths because, uh, of course, here those paths seem to intertwine. Yeah, and you know, I really, as much as I said I made the decision to go the other way, a lot of what I photographed was researchers because I had that background. It was something that I was familiar with. Kind of the fact that I was a, a researcher myself I think sometimes put the researchers that I was photographing at ease. I always felt that their research was more important than my photos, so I I didn't try to be pushy and everything. I I like to let things kind of transpire and and work with them as opposed to against them. So it helped me out a lot. But I was really, really lucky because I got to meet a lot of actually what turned out to be my heroes, photographic heroes, who ended up helping me along the way and now became my colleagues. So it's kind of been a a, a bit of a, a whirlwind run for me. I can't say it was a dream because I never thought this is where I would be. As a matter of fact, I often think, you know, I was a kid from Patterson, New Jersey, the inner city. Fortunately, I spent my summers on Cape Cod at the beach. And that's where I first entered the ocean and I spent all of my time snorkeling in the marshes, snorkeling along the beach. But I think still to this day, my roots back in Patterson, one of these days someone's going to uh, come up to me and say, hey, I know you. You, What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, I, I knew you in Patterson. What are you doing here? So it's kind of odd. Uh, it really, I, I, it's weird for me to be in this profession. Yeah, you're telling me I got my degree in playwriting. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, but passion leads us, you know, and I, I think a lot of people struggle to find that passion because it is kind of its own creator of, of momentum. Yeah, you know, and I think, um, now you kids stay in school, but I think that it's a combination of things. There was something that I really was passionate about, really interested in, that I wanted to do above all else. And I, I wanted to photograph all of a sudden. And I really, I really, really get into pushing the button. You know, once I make the image, I like seeing the results and things of that sort. But what I really like is is making of the photography. But I think that I passed up a lot of other, what say my family would call opportunities for a good job because I wanted to play. To me, that's what it was. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes 
for me. I look back and I think, yeah, you know, I kept thinking to myself, yeah, I'll do this uh, just one more time and then I'll get a job. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, oh, I'm 60. <laughs> what was I? I forgot. <laughs> but yet here we are heading to Antarctica. Yeah, isn't that a kick in the butt, you know? And you and I have traveled now pretty much a lot of the world in both polar regions and in both the the Atlantic and the Pacific. And who would have figured? I went back to visit Patterson, New Jersey, and it was after a school reunion that I didn't attend but I think I, once these reunions happen, some of the old friends kind of get together and they heard I was coming to New Jersey. So they decided, oh, well, we're all going to go out to dinner. And my best friend in both grammar school and high school was Ross D'Amelio. And I was sitting across the table from him in the restaurant and he looked at me and I, I won't use the exact words that he used, but he said, Morello. You wrote a book. <laughs> he said, you wrote a book. How do I? I can't explain to people. I know somebody who wrote a book. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, you know. And then I, when I look at it through his eyes, I think, how did I write a book? <laughs> I never thought I would be doing something like that. Really, I, I have very similar feelings. Just sort of. Sometimes I'm 50 feet underwater, you know, about as far away from safety as I can be, surrounded by things that have no spines, and you just kind of have that moment of how, or, or you know, or perhaps this, the next sensation is, how can I always do this? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And even when both of us look back at what we've been able to do experientially in our lives you know uh, i think that if uh, the spirit of christmas yet to come knocked on my door and said hey it's your time i really i look back and i said you know the things that i've been able to do i've lived a hundred lives and crammed them into my lifetime and the experiences that i've had are just remarkable i don't even know where to begin to sometimes it's even embarrassing for me to, to be at a party and someone finds out what I do and then you know they come up and they want to know about your experiences or where you've gone to and you're telling them about places that would be a once in a lifetime journey for them and here we get to go back time and time again year after year after year and you know so it's it's almost like Geez, why? How do I deserve to do this? And and yet, uh, I mean, all of that sounds like this carousel of wonder, and I, I I sympathize. But you do so well of inviting the people who come down here into your own experience, and I think you 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 kind of kick it into overdrive. Of course, you put someone on a beach full of penguins, and their eyes are going to go wide, and they're going to giggle, and they're going to ooh and ah. But then they get to turn to someone like you and, and they're saying, how, how can my relationship with this camera accentuate this experience even more? And I've watched you do it over the years. And not only do you do it with skill, but you do it with humor, which is magnificent. <laughs> well, to a lot of people, sometimes the humor isn't exactly understood. But above all else, you know, I'm a photographer now. I was a biologist before, but I have always in my, uh, I would say, conscious life been an environmentalist. And we are very lucky because we get to wow people with whales and penguins and polar bears and all this other incredible stuff. My goal and my desire is that, you know, if I can get them connected during these wow moments, Maybe when they go back home, they will see that wow moment in, uh, you know, the, the house finch in their backyard or the wildflowers in a prairie or things of that sort. And really, that's 
that is always my goal. I teach photography privately and my students always are jazzed about the fact that I get to go around the world and photograph cool things and they always say yeah that's what I want to do I want to go and see the polar bears or the elephants or the rhinos or whatever and I say to them you know you need to be able to find the wonder and the stuff that you see every single day the little brown birds the the blades of grass all of those things if you can do that then when you do get the chance to go to one of the exotic places it's going to be all that much more meaningful for you um and so that's that's really what i want to do i want to be able to get people to find the wow factor in everything around them yeah and i i applaud you for that i have laughed and learned with you as we go but i think that kind of is approaching something similar that perhaps a thousand page religious text might even try and approach, which is to be present, to be aware of, you know, just the rarity of life in whatever form it takes. And and that's why, and I've heard you describe yourself, you know, you're not a wildlife photographer, you're a photographer, you're always looking for the moment in sort of any interaction. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm, I'm kind of going back a step here, but the experiences that we have on the ship, off the ship, in other places that we go, it's a shared experience. I'm not just here um, by myself. I'm not just here with the guest. I'm here with other people, you being one of them, all the other staff members that I get to work with who have this philosophy and who have this common thread that runs between us. And being with all of my colleagues feeds me and it encourages me. But more importantly, I learn so much from all the other staff around me who are trying to do it in their way. You know, maybe they're not a photographer, they're a bird watcher, or they're the undersea specialist. And to see everybody so intoxicated with what they do is, it's just, that in itself is another experience. So. Yeah, it's not a a solo journey. So you are now on the board of one of my favorite organizations. Could you talk about that? Ah, yeah. I'm on the board of Alaska Whale Foundation. It's a nonprofit organization based in Petersburg, Alaska. Uh, We are primarily a research institution. We have an education uh, or a research center on the coast of, in Southeast Alaska, where we help graduate students. Uh, we give them a place to come and do their research. We give them room and board and, and lab and a boat so that they can do what they need to do. We also are, uh, we have a, a now a, a staff biologist. Our executive director, Andy Savo, is still actively doing his research and yeah we're, we're growing in leaps and bounds and it's a really cool thing to be a part of we also are responsible for the disentanglement of whales in the southeast alaska area there we work with a lot of other organizations as a matter of fact that's one of our our primary focuses is is kind of bringing all of the little people and yeah, I, I say the little organizations that are doing fantastic work, either in research or conservation or education, and bringing them together so that we kind of have a common voice uh, and we can support each other and, and do some real good work in Southeast Alaska, whether it's research, conservation, applied conservation as in the disentanglement of whales and education. Yeah, the work that comes out of AWF for short is amazing. And I think Southeast Alaska is perhaps one of the best places on earth to see sort of that charismatic activity of these humpback whales. How would you describe uh, a bubble net event to someone who has never heard of it? Frickin' awesome. If I was to say it from the photographer's person, the photographer in me, it is just pure excitement when you have multiple whales you know many many tons each working in unison 
and in working in a way that's it's predictable you know you see it you can tell where they're going to come up and and through Andy's work and also Fred Sharp one of the other scientists with us some of the the breakthroughs they've made in the behavior in the feeding and foraging strategies of humpback whale it enables you to uh to really understand what's going to happen where it's going to happen and it is just this eruption of life that you behold and and you know sometimes you get seven or eight or 15 whales coming to the surface at one time mouths agape and water everywhere and herring jumping out of the way and birds swooping in to get theirs it's just this explosion of life that really connects everything together i've heard you tell several stories over the years but uh, one i want to hear in greater detail is the time you had to break into the lighthouse to survive oh well it was uh yeah i (laughs) i uh what was happening i was involved as a data collector for a project on harbor seals and i had the very glamorous job of collecting seal poo so in order to do it for a period of time i got permission from the cape cod national seashore for two of us to camp out on long point which is the very tip of cape cod Before we let Steve finish his story, I think we need to clarify a thing or two about what these scientists were getting up to. Because generally, when you hear someone talking about Cape Cod, you don't imagine someone studying animal poo. At least, that's not what makes it into the tourism brochures. Now, poo has a lot of different names, filtering out the ones we don't have to bleep out. You have waste, scat, excrement, stool, fecal matter, feces, and a few more juvenile synonyms. Mostly, it's the stuff you don't want to have to step in. But whereas a pedestrian strives to avoid such things, scientists are often drawn to it, not out of a morbid and odor-rich curiosity, but rather for the information that it can provide. The feces of marine mammals specifically allows us to know a great deal about how the animal is living and what it is eating. Not everything gets fully digested, which can leave behind a roadmap of clues. For instance, the durable ear bones of fish, known as otoliths, and exoskeletons of crustaceans can be found by sorting through the, let's call it, discarded matter. Scientists can also see if the diet of an animal is lacking, or overly rich in certain substances such as iron, which helps paint the picture of their interaction with the local environment. Lastly, scientists can see if the creature is consuming plastic, which, unfortunately, a lot of them are. Actually, nearly all marine creatures are now found to have some sort of plastic in their digestive system, be it from direct consumption or by consuming prey that has eaten it. Personally, I think that is way more disgusting than poo. So, how about we all stop drinking out of plastic straws and pretending like convenience isn't killing our planet? I'm Charlotte Fisher, and this has been a very hygienic creature feature. Take it away, Steve. And I had the very glamorous job of collecting seal poo. So in order to do it for a period of time, I got permission from the Cape Cod National Seashore for two of us to camp out on Long Point, which is the very tip of Cape Cod. And you get to the end of the developed Cape, the area in Provincetown, and then you go out onto a barrier spit, a sand spit that jets out and forms one end of Provincetown Harbor. It's a short distance away from town, but it's a three mile walk from the end of town out to the tip. You kind of cross some low lying areas and things, and we went out there to camp. The weather report was not at all uh, threatening. Um, it was actually incredible. It was during the winter or late fall, and we were walking around during the day with just, you know, a flannel shirt, so it was pretty easy. But it was the perfect storm. Literally, it was that storm known as the perfect storm that just kind of hit us 
uh, and blindsided us. And it cut us off from the rest of the Cape. It made the tip of Cape Cod at high tide an island. It got very cold. We had snow around us and we weren't getting a lot of sleep. Fortunately, because, you know, we were able to monitor the fact that our land, the land that we were camping on, was getting smaller and smaller. As the tide, the surge came up and the winds really picked up, we couldn't cross to get back to town. And our only option was, fortunately, the lighthouse out at Long Point. And the lighthouse had a lock on it, but... You know, we all have our various skills and that that Patterson, New Jersey upbringing (laughs) afforded me the knowledge of how to get the lock open. And so we opened and and we spent the night in that lighthouse. And then early in the morning, actually, I mean, people, lots of people knew we were out there and lots of people called to get us rescued, but nobody could rescue us. The park service couldn't drive out to us because we were cut off. And the Coast Guard had zero visibility and didn't know where exactly we would end up or how they would get a boat to the shore or anything of that sort. So we, it was just one of those things where we were on our own. So we spent the night in the lighthouse and at first light, we buried all of our gear because we didn't want it just blowing off everywhere because at that point it was low tide we were able to cross the break and then walk out uh, across the jetty and get back into town, much to the surprise of everybody else. Um, Yeah, and and it was weird. It was a, um, we got back, we went to my favorite restaurant that no longer exists, Rags and Roses, to have a really big breakfast. We were so cold and then went back to the place where I was living. I remember just shivering, just shivering for a couple of hours just because we were warming up again. And it was a scary incident. Now it's it's kind of funny and, you know, I make jokes and stuff. At the time, it really was scary. I didn't know what was going to happen. And there was a lot of, what the hell am I doing Um, going through my head there? But, yeah. I can't imagine. Did you get any sleep that night? Oh, none whatsoever. None whatsoever. It was a loud night because of the wind and, uh, more importantly, I guess, a worrisome night. Because, I mean, I knew the lighthouse was going to be fine, but I also kept wondering, geez, is this lighthouse going to be okay? (laughs) So, yeah. No kidding. Well, I got to ask, did you you break the lock or did you pick it? Well, there's... I didn't pick it, but there's this technique where if you hit... um, Not all padlocks are like that, but some padlocks if you hit the two sides at the same time with um say hammers or rocks or whatever the ball bearing inside it goes to the center and it allows the the ball bearing it fits in the notch of the little loop on the top but because it it gets kind of shocked into the center it pops the lock open jersey skills <laughs> <laughs> oh that's incredible I don't think it can do that anymore with new locks. So don't try this at home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Disclaimer, disclaimer. Yeah. You choose a unique and very specific phrase to how to describe your photography. And I'd, I'd like to hear you talk about that. Uh, I, uh, I, call it the, I call it photography through a positive lens. And what I mean by that is that when you approach the art of making images, uh, so many people always are are concerned about what their cameras or their phones or their whatever device they're using to make images isn't good enough. They, They always think of it in terms of, oh, this can't do that. And I like people to think, well, yeah, I understand there's a limitation to what my camera can do, but what's the potential? What are the positives and what can I try to get from this piece of equipment? Um, because then, uh, you know, if you, you think of this is how far I can go, then there's that wall. But if you think of, well, what can I do? Then you have a world of possibilities. And um, this philosophy came about because a friend of mine 
Mario Corvetto, a, a colleague, a photographer who was photographing for the United Nations, for UNICEF, in Bosnia, right after the Bosnian War. And um, he was there to photograph kids in an orphanage. And, you know, he's a happy guy, just like us. And he was saying, oh, we're going to have fun today to the kids. We're going to joke. We're going to play games and everything. And then I'm going to shoot some pictures of you. And a, a young boy got up and came over to him and said to him, please, mister, we've been shot at enough. Please don't shoot at us anymore. And, you know, that's like a kick in the gut to Mario. And he told me that. And both of us were like, wow, you know, geez, look at the way we talk about our craft. We're supposed to be you know, kind of artists and we're supposed to be peaceful guys and things. And, and we say we're going to shoot and we're going to take photos and we're going to do all these things that uh, the way we talk about cameras, you know, we stalk our prey and and we're hunting with the cameras. It's, it's kind of militaristic. Um, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that stuff about I don't I don't not against hunting or whatever, but it's not what I do with a camera. You know, and I'm not looking to capture an image of something. I'm looking to portray that image in a way that, you know, makes people say, wow, that's beautiful or, or whatever. So we both decided that from then on, we would use different language to describe our craft. And I found in a very short period of time, it actually had a physical effect on the way I made images. And by just saying that, make images instead of take a photo, it slowed me down. You know, when you think of taking a photo, I think of taking a photo. I think of just holding up a, a, a camera, doing a little happy snap and going on our way. Um, when I think of making an image, you know, I'm thinking about the light. I'm thinking about my background and my foreground and all these different things. It slowed me down and it made me a much better photographer. And I found that really intriguing that simply by changing my attitude and changing the nomenclature in which I describe what I do, it made me better at it. Um, it got me more connected to my craft. Well, I definitely want to give a shout out to your lady who is a marine educator herself. Yes, Susan Pike. She's a high school science teacher as passionate about that as I am about my career. And she does a blog? Uh, she does a weekly nature column. It's syndicated around New Hampshire, Maine, and Northern Massachusetts. She's, yeah, actually she's a far better naturalist than I am. She knows, I know about whales and the things that we get always to see and I get home and she's looking at mushrooms and berries and things in our, our forest and she asked me about them and I'll say, ah, I don't know. And she'll say, oh, well, this is what it is. So, yeah, she kind of puts me to shame there. Where can people find out more about your work and also Alaska Whale Foundation? Well, AWF is if they can just do a search on alaskawhalefoundation.org. And so they can take a look there. For me, it's stevemorello.com is my website or at Steve Morello for Instagram. Hopefully... Um, They'll see it everywhere. <laughs> and uh, a question I, I enjoy, and I think I might know the answer with you, is were you to be reincarnated as an ocean critter, what might it be? Jeez, and oh, you know, people ask that, and I always have trouble with that because I got to tell you, I'm a bit of a coward, and I always think wild animals typically don't die in their sleep. <laughs> And <laughs> I think if I could come back as any animal, it would be my dog. But as a marine animal, you know, I, I guess it would be easy to say a whale or a dolphin or something of that sort. But I think sometimes maybe a small critter, a crab that gets to hide under a rock and watch the world go by. And perhaps to finish, just anything that you want to say about how human should think about the ocean yeah well, it's part of the pun a very deep subject there i think that they should think about the ocean not as just a place for their enjoyment 
not just as a place where we have food. Although, you know, I think if we, if maybe if we thought more about it as a place where we keep our food, we might be less inclined to dirty it so much. I wish that people would understand how important the ocean is. I think that I'm kind of lucky that I get to show pictures of whales because it's easy for people to get excited about it. But I think about the things like copepods and um, the arthropod, all the plankton, the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, and the corals and all those things that are just dying. And it makes me sad, it makes me worried, it makes me feel guilty that I'm part of the organism that's doing that. I, I concur and agree, which I just said the same thing twice, but we have a duty because of this access that we have, we become stewards of these places. Our hope is always to affect the minds and the hearts and the behaviors of those we interact with, because it is only then that true change can happen. Yeah, really. Well, Steve, thank you for sitting down with me. We're on our way, Antarctica, in, in but a few days, and so many more photographic opportunities ahead. Hey, look forward to it, Paul. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our show. We thank you for listening, and don't forget, you can find more podcast episodes, educational content, and ways to donate tax-free on our website at meettheocean.org. All proceeds go towards helping us continue our educational outreach and sharing more stories like Steve's to emphasize why the ocean matters most. I'm Paul North, your host, and until next time, may the salt water be with you. ocean aficionados. This is Adrian Bosworth here to say that this episode of Meet the Ocean was produced by Paul North and Andrew Gettings, who also edited and mixed the sweet, sweet sounds that you heard. Kelsey Anderson laid down the sound design with original music composed by artist Vin Gast. Special, special thanks to our guest Steve Morello for sharing his story and to Charlotte Fisher for her hygienic Creature feature. Don't forget to subscribe in order to never miss an episode and to rate and review the podcast on iTunes or whatever platform that you use. Thank you for listening and tune in next time for more ocean conservation content. Mm-hmm.